It is my tremendous pleasure <laughs> to have Axel Rubel with us. Uh, I think there are some people in the audience who know Axel, but uh, those who don't know Axel, he's been with HCDR, not with CASUS, for ages. I think that's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and has been working um, uh, as, a, as a student and as a master's student. Maybe Globus, sorry. Last, last, yeah, last, last, yeah, last, last, last man standing. Um, and then as a PhD student. Uh, and now he's for some reason in Berkeley. Um, and he's going to tell us about what he's doing at Berkeley right now, what Berkeley's been up to. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to have seen already some folks from uh, Dresden joining in, like Mike. Hi, Mike. Good morning. Um, yeah, so Axel, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, glad to be able to travel again, um, to talk to people and uh, continue a lot of collaborations that we, of course, continued when I moved to Berkeley. Um, I will talk today about particle accelerator modeling and excess scale, um, which is exactly the mission that we have in our institute and in our division at Berkeley Lab. I'm part of the Accelerator Technology and Applied Physics Division at Berkeley Lab. And in there, we have the Accelerator Modeling Group, which is led by John McVay. The uh, focus here will be exactly on modeling of party accelerators that we need and related topics. Um, and this includes both conventional and um, uh, advanced party accelerators. The things that I will show here is really part of, of work that we are leading at Berkeley Lab, but it is contributed by and also significantly shaped by a lot of collaborators that are trying to list here by institute. So we are developing our, our modeling tools at LB and Ellen in the open and shared it with people. We have contributors and active users at Livermore, at Slack. We have great contributions from CAR, specifically everything, everything high field related. Daisy is, is actively contributing and developing codes so I will show you. And then we have also a couple of companies actually using our code and contributing back. Um, and then we have adoptions also at CERN for the dynamics modeling with new crab cavities there. So let me first show you a little bit the team that we have in-house. Um, we have a multidisciplinary team led by our PI, Jean Bay, that is constituted from both physicists, uh, but also mathematicians, applied mathematicians, and computer scientists, um, and then close collaborators, for example, computational divisions, as well as the external folks that I just mentioned. Um, yeah, we constitute from both postdocs, for example, we might know Marco Garten that recently joined us, um, um, up to staff scientists and senior scientists that, that lead the group. Um, I will talk a lot about the BLAST ecosystem today, um, the codes that are on there. Um, and yeah, if you have more detailed questions, you can always go in there, but I try to keep it a little bit high level and not going too much into, into details. So the talk will be started as follows. Um, first, I introduce you the uh, Beam Plasma Accelerator Simulation Toolkit. Um, that's a project that we, uh, we started many years ago as PLAS, as Berkeley Lab Acceleration Toolkit, um, but intentionally renamed because of so many contributions in, in the open and to give credit to all the folks and give them visibility. So that's not a Berkeley Lab project anymore. Um, then I will talk a little bit about IO standardization, open development. Um, some that worked with me before know that that's a, a topic that I'm long term uh, pushing. And then I'll go a little bit into exascale computing, uh, specifically the things that we develop here uh, in the exascale computing project, which is a large multi year project that's coming to conclusion next uh, 2023, 2024 in the US and has the mission to deliver not only the hardware, but also the applications for the first exascale computing machines in the world. The quick background, and I think most of you know this, but since we have CASAS and we also have uh, different people with uh, different backgrounds in here, I just want to have a slide on party accelerators. Why are we researching this in general? Um, and why it has such a long traditional set of working there? Um, party accelerators are really ominous in, in a ton of domains. Uh, in medicine, for example, you're well aware that there are thousands of accelerators in the world to do your x-ray, but also to do anything from radiation treatment and tumor treatment up to creating isotopes uh, for routine procedures. Um, industry is probably the biggest, uh, biggest user of accelerators. There are tens of thousands of applications from manufacturing, which is the, probably the most expensive part there, up to anything like sterilization, food processing, accelerators are used. Um, 
In the US, also very important the topics national security. That is anything from cargo scanning um, for yeah, basically uh, threat resilience, um, stewardship actually also of, of the stockpile in the US. Um, for all these things, uh, but for control, you need anything to monitor things. And of course, big discovery machines. Um, if you look at physical Nobel Prizes, actually every third of them is enabled really by party accelerators and they drive discoveries um, for decades and decades to come, hopefully. And there's obviously a big opportunity if we can make machines both for discovery but also applications smaller and reduce that cost, we can increase the impact um, and do more of that. Then just a quick overview, we are modeling group. So there's uh, one, one of our, our working course is the particle cell algorithm. And there's actually not only one, but there's a whole family of particle cell algorithms. The one that, or the two applications that are really interesting for us in our division is conventional accelerators and then uh, advanced accelerators like plasma main field accelerators. And for those, you actually need totally different modeling capabilities because you're talking about, I mean, fundamentally different scales, right? If you look at the machine on the left here, that's filling a hole, um, compared to the one on the right, which is like maybe a few millimeters with structures that are tens of nanometers or micrometers in size. Um, so on the left hand side, long evolution, what you need is S based uh, particle cell. Um, it means you want to follow a reference particle, have like, for example, symplectic maps, uh, map particles in relative to, to the reference particle instead of integrating explicitly in time. Um, and um, with that, you can actually avoid um, a lot of errors and you want to be uh, uh, symplectic, you want to conserve the energy. Then on the right hand side, uh, and in the middle, the most generic version is doing full electromagnetic particle cell or um, a reduced version of electrostatic where you can solve potentials every time step. It just depends if you're, important, if you're really in, uh, interested in ventilation effects or not. Um, and um, then on the right hand side, you can optimize things down for example, quasi stability approximation, following something that's going on in Nexus. Um, and what we develop here, I just highlight three of the codes um, of the probably like 10 codes that we have in our division that are, that are recently modernized um, that do this. On the left hand side, we have the impact suite of codes, specifically impact X is our newest open source release um, that does space party modeling. In the middle, about X is an electrostatic and electromagnetic party cell code. Um, and on the right hand side, we have new codes such as HyPES++, plus plus, which is led by our collaborators at DAISY. What our goal is generally in our in M, so the accelerator modeling program in, in our division is to offer tools that allow you on the fly tunability for the physics and the merits that you actually need. So you basically have a couple of challenges and you cannot all address them with a high fidelity simulation. So at the right hand side, for example, if you're looking for great detailed physics runs, you want to do discovery, for example, and want to really understand the detail of your physics. Then you have to go tune up and say like, okay, I need a full 3D simulation, full resolution, first principles. So for example, electromagnetic pick. Um, while on the other hand, you want to maybe optimize the machine. You want to maybe optimize staging of a laser matrix, or uh, you want to maybe optimize, um, yeah, anything that they, they want to have quickly an understanding and map of your physics problem. And therefore, then you want to go to reduced physics or reduced geometry or resolution. Um, or cross surrogate models uh, that you can quickly query and, um, and go forward. And for that, you want to have ensemble runs and anything that runs faster. The, in order to deliver these tools, um, we intentionally write multiple codes, uh, but we try to reuse as much as possible between them. And specifically, you try to standardize as much as possible. Because in the end, you look at physics of particles going through an accelerator. So what we do is we standardize both on the input. Um, very, uh, very standardized is a code pick me interface, which is just giving you a nice standardized interface that you can switch from one code to the other and always do the same physics. And for output and data analysis or chaining of codes, we use OpenPMD, which I'll show you a little bit later, which is a project that we started at HCR together with Berkeley Lab already in 14, 15, and since then, um, <laughs> 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 effectively, uh, that's also today here, uh, it's a really a fruitful collaboration and we, um, while, while you're driving this basically in Europe, you're tr trying to drive this um, in the US National Accelerator Labs with, with DOE funding. And so we have like people like Slack, UCLA, and Fermilab involved that implement this also in their codes and, and widen this. So that's the overall, um, overall overview. Let's, let's go a little bit into detail of the WAPX code um, that, that most probably know that I'm working on. So WAPX is um, an electrostatic and electromagnetic fully kinetic party and cell code. Um, the electrostatic part, I'm not, not showing here on this slide. Um, you can basically scrap out uh, two of the points here um, because there you basically take your sources and calculate your potentials and push further. But the electromagnetic part of the code is, is probably well known for you. 
we push particles to have the position of currents or fields, scatter fields on a grid. And what we do is we specifically see our strengths in the developing advanced algorithms. So our group um, is, for example, the inventor of the boost and frame technique, which you can use um, if you have long uh, travel distances um, in uh, along an axis. Uh, they you don't transform and don't solve everything at the same time, but you actually stretch time out. And with that, you can um, solve, yeah, reduce a lot of the computational needs. But at the same time, when you do this, you have to also boost everything that's coming in front of you. So you don't have static targets anymore, gas jet, everything is flying at you it's close to the speed of light. Um, and yeah, actually, you have to really look into field solving and keep everything stable um, numerically. And that's one of the big motivations why we look into things like new spectral solvers instead of FTD schemes. Um, then we have things like Galilean frame um, transformations. We uh, do active research in adaptive mesh climate. And then we have things like embedded boundaries that you need for parting accelerated research um, to actually have realistic field modeling and interactions. Then, yeah, both physics modules are included. So for field ionization, coulomb direction, collisions, 2D processes, um, and microscopic materials, um, that opens up yeah, a ton of modeling possibilities. And then the what I showed you in the last slide is there's really, I mean, this, this is really, you cannot just have one flavor, right? You have, you want to have somewhere at the knob where you can tune between being super fast, being precise, really using the geometry that you have. And so we specifically, specifically implement this, like four different geometries, um, how you can solve your problems from 1D, 2D, 3D, um, up to RZ, which is uh, basically a variation. I mean, it starts um, of having a cylindrical geometry, but you can evolve that in modes. Um, and can add more and more on that, which is basically allowing you to do a lot of problems that are close to access, but don't have to be axisymmetric um, at the cost of basically a couple of 2D simulations. Then the typical things that we do, we develop this for exascale. Um, collision ionization implemented in Bob X as well. That's a good question, depends on the model you ask. So yeah, we have a general model, but yeah, depends on the model we can, um, can follow up. Then, um, Thank you, exactly. So, parallelization, they have one thing that you need is dynamic loop connections. So everything is from the beginning built up to both allow you to do things like mesh refinement, um, which is an active research task, but it's working quite well already for the first scenarios, and distribute your things over tens of thousands of nodes where you have parties accumulating in one corner or the other. Everything works on all match operating systems. Um, no, there's no recommend combination model in there um, yet. Um, and um, yeah. And parallel IO I already talked about. All right. Then just a little motivation. The uh, one of the things that we need to deliver, or what is our yeah, what is our promise and um, from our division specifically from our partners at the Bella program, which are part of our division, is to research the staging of uh, laser wave field accelerators towards the development of future colliders. So that means we have to stage tens, hundreds, maybe potentially thousands of, of, of stages and to be, go into the energy frontier and see if laser wave accelerators can deliver that in the future. Um, and so what we're doing is we develop the modeling tools for that. We make sure that we, that we can actually plan this ahead um, and, and, and control that. The vision for that is described in the picture on the top here, um, paper by Karl Schröder, I think. The zoom is probably cutting off the, the reference for that. But um, yeah, the, the idea is really to stage uh, accelerators, um, compete in new lasers, and yeah, keep emissions low between these stages. And what we demonstrated here, uh, it's actually last year, I think we're now at 20 stages, is to model this um, with Wild X. Um, and yeah, follow mean energy increase that you can see in the middle slide uh, between the stages, and we really get this up and at the same time controlling charge, uh, controlling emissions, and then um, yeah, divergence. Um, and in the middle is the live visualization that we did. So, this was running on Summit. Um, and as we run the simulation, we just rendered this directly out with a library developed in the Exascape Computing Project. This was a um, boosted frame simulation. That's a boosted frame simulation. Yeah, I can see it in here. Yeah, exactly. All right. Then, implementing the methods in the Bison Max that we had before, um, that's of course not the only application that you have for particle and cell code. So the method side are just motivated plus some accelerators, but we also use this for laser ion interaction at LB and L. We have our collaborators use this for QD physics um, and radiation generation. We have users at L and L, um, but also like industry applications. For example, here fusion devices 
of thermionic converters um, are problems that you can access in industry reporting and cell codes. And if you have advanced material treatments, you can even go on to microelectronics or we do uh, astrophysical modeling, like reconnections or pulsars. A couple of the details, I just want to show this up in case that's interesting for people who will develop parting in cell codes. We have a couple of recent papers on new numerics um, that came out in the last year, this year. Um, the, one of the things is the spectral order uh, solvers. So they give you good control over any property that you want to have, like electromagnetic base propagating. We have an update to that that actually combines the benefit of these staggered uh, properties that you had from FTTD solvers, which are conventionally used, and the uh, pseudo spectral methods that's described in, in this paper. And they give you basically a speed up um, specifically because they don't need that much resolution and have higher stability. And we also continue to develop the GEM transformation between yeah, plasma background and the things that you accelerate. Um, and we have new codes like the high pace plus plus code, which is uh, led by Maxence TVD and Stephen Dietrich, um, which are just actually archived and I was just published. And you can yeah, download this one. So that one is specifically for wave feed modeling, um, currently plasma based wave feed modeling. Um, that's a really great tool to speed up the simulations. Then we have QED modules, and we already talked a little bit about this with, with, with Uber. Um, the um, that's an implementation by Lucas Levy et al. from CEA. Um, the Monte Carlo module uh, for high field effects. Um, and then we have the latest release. Oh, actually, sorry. Uh, it's updated now, it was released last week. <laughs> um, it's in the copy slides. Uh, Impact X, um, that's the latest file accelerator code. And yeah, that one is still an active development, but it's already useful. And that's why I think we just continue to develop it in the open and, and make it available to the community. And yes, of course, more parts. Is, is this, uh, this is a standard electrostatic. Yes, yes, yes. Um, sp yeah, space charge effects you have to add manually for the space uh, codes. Okay. Correct. Um, and you can turn them on and off when you need them. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, actually, yes, actually the space charge is landing this week. So, the space charge is not in there, but you have all the models that transform. Is, 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 yeah. is, is this a cylindrical or is this really full cool of No, it's full. Yeah, it's full cool. Yeah, yeah, correct. Um, no retardation or anything. No, you don't have this in, in this code. Yeah. Okay. yeah, also have to, in these codes, also have to add um, if you have these R effects, you have to model them or make feed effects. You have mm -hmm. to model them um, manually. Exactly. Then, yeah, just a quick example of a, of a code. I just want to show you high pace plus plus as an example um, for ultra fast wake field modeling. Um, so, specifically for wake fields, you have the nice effect that you can actually decouple most of the, of the physics that's happening in the uh, longitudinal direction. Um, and you can do a couple of approximations there uh, by doing, for example, only quasi static solves in the transversal plane. And the high pace plus plus code is a re implementation of high pace plus plus on GPUs um, with adaptive mesh refinement. Um, and that one really allows you to actually stripe through simulation and update fields in one go into really large time steps and, and do, yeah, due to that, uh, really efficient wake field simulations. Um, so that's something, if that's of interest to you, to do PWFA modeling, um, check this out. Um, this is yeah, a new code by Daisy and is based on the same technology that we're developing at Berkeley Lab. Then, just a quick overview for people to work on software to see how our software stack is looking. So, we base, uh, we, we build an integrate, we, we really aim to build an integrated ecosystem that you can extend with the physics needs and with the application needs that you have. We intentionally make this available for all major operating systems. Because if you have an ultra fast model, there's no reason why you shouldn't model this on your Windows laptop in a Python notebook. Um, that's actually also a good trick to look in uh, new people into HPC. So um, always make a Windows module uh, and get new users. Uh, we, then if you go to HPC and we need more than one node, we base everything on open standards um, or at least open community or widely adopted things. MPI, uh, the message passing interface is there. And then you have to the open MP, circle hip to have all the flavors of CPUs and GPUs that are currently used for, to be used from Intel and NVIDIA. A central component for us is MRX. Uh, MRX is a library developed, um, also an exoscale computing project and by our colleagues at Lab and the Computational Research Division, uh, which provides us with com containers, communication, portability, and utilities. Um, and specifically for mesh refinement. So from the beginning, we divide all our codes that are mesh refinement capable. How easy that is, that is to implement for the individual numerics. So for an electromagnetic part in cycle, it's very more complicated than for a static one. Depends, of course, but um, this is fully from the beginning thought after as well into, so that you can extend this. 
Then you have math libraries, FTTs, linear algebra. We use standards for those, also from Exascale. Diagnostics, um, we have um, in situ diagnostics and file based diagnostics with the open PMD standard that we look into later a little bit, um, as well as in situ visualization. So, VTKM, for example, is the thing that drives everything from Paraview, Visit, um, and situ modeling, is, um, and it's the new rebuilt one in Exascale to um, yeah, work with all the new GPUs. And we can just on the fly with that render out, have uh, unified controls and create scenes just as you do it in post processing in your tools. Then the things that gets more interesting for domain scientists is Pixar is a library that we is, is intentionally developed in a way that you can reuse it between different codes. You can benchmark them individually. There's an implementation in Pixar that tries this on MREX. We have comparisons of implementing this on Cocos, for example, um, to get performance. You could implement this also on other things like Alpaca. Um, so that's yeah, standalone. And then we create here this new interface, uh, this new middle uh, middleware library, which you call a blaster, accelerated blast recipes, where we share the common party and cell physics, party accelerator, and laser physics components between the different codes. And on that, we then actually implement our code. So WarbX is then implementing the numerics for electromagnetic and electrostatic full pick. We have high pace plus plus, we talked about this. Artemis is another code that is based on uh, the WarbX implementation, does microelectronics modeling, impact X accelerated lattice design, and we continue like this to update our whole code base from um, from the great numerics that we had already, um, update new numerics and implementing them from the ground up to use this modern software stack. And on top of that, then we add this unification with Python so you can script from desktop to HPC by just having a very descriptive interface um, that then calls all these super tuned HPC components underneath and also is responsible for uh, doing connections to AI and ML, um, which is in frameworks usually also developed in Python. Um, and it's way more comfortable that way to bind in when you connect codes or when you connect surrogate models. All right, so that's the overview about the toolings that we have. Um, then let's go a little bit into IO standardization or development that we do. There's a very common data challenge, um, both on experiments but also on performance computing, is, is that we are basically really running out of being able to still store our data. So generated data currently, and I took an example here from, a, from the summit cluster at, uh, at the time, but it's um, continuing more and more in the direction is, um, actually it's not summit, that's even still tight, but it doesn't matter, it's just a fact of 10 words now, <laughs> is um, just, just for modeling, we're currently able to create easily like 100 terabytes per second on these clusters, now it's a fact of 10 words, um, by just creating updates and iterations on our simulations. Um, you can take, you can one to one replace this and put in a, a megahertz camera, megapixels, and have the same data rates. The problem is coming in the moment that you want to get the data out of the thing that computes it or that measures it. And there you have already the first interfaces. So, we have, for example, PCI Express interfaces. We have, for example, NB Link, NB Fast, Fast Hardware. But that already, I mean, cuts down your bandwidth just getting out of the node that you're currently in by a factor of 10. Um, and then you try to make it store permanently um, as file to later on look at it. And then you lose again a factor of 200 roughly to get data to this. Um, and it means effectively the moment that you have high data rates for cameras, the moment that you have high data rates for simulations, uh, iterations, um, and you yeah, want to create data, the, you have a gap basically of an order of 10 to 4. And so four those magnitude between being able to create data and looking at that. And um, the the, so the approach to just store and analyze everything by looking, we are finding out later what happened in both simulation or experiment becomes more and more unaffordable. Um, that's, and that's a thing that we always have to keep in mind, right? With every update, we have also like an experiment, for example, another nice lead for us is we want to upgrade Bella to be, um, to be high rep rate, kilohertz capable in the future. And that's totally different to the few hertz that you currently do in these electric accelerators. Um, so what we have to do, we have to go to opportunities, we have to analyze the tasks that are varying with fidelity needs um, on the fly. And a lot of these things can be done maybe in situ, and this will be a, a little bit of motivation. What is in situ processing and why do we need to research that? So the change that I showed you is basically the question is, do you actually need the raw data or are you actually looking for some physics, something specific? Um, so a trivial example could be, well, if you, if you for example, take a camera image of a beam, right? The, it could be that you're at the end actually just interested in an ellipsoid or just moving around or where's the center. Um, or you maybe want to have an FFT of that and, and characterize a couple of features in there. Um, if you have a particle, you usually are not interested in every particle of a beam, but you want to maybe have the, the histogram of that or you want to have a face-based projection 
Both these things are data processing and data reduction examples. You take input that might be a, a million or 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 11 points from a camera or from a beam and project them down to something that is actually just a few a thousand or a few uh, few maybe a million pixels uh, that's that's already that's already a lot you can of course compress as well uh, things lossless or lossy um which we are which we're, uh, which we're checking if this is working with our algorithms uh, still keeping the uh, the qualities of interest uh, conserved or you can do very complicated things like in the tier form of isaac for example they say yeah at time and if we i showed in previous slide with other raycasters is you can take a huge simulation that is hundreds of terabytes in size and create a data stream from that. You can create a 4K video with virtual reality built in. That is still orders of magnitude smaller than, than actually storing your data and looking at it later. Um, and similarly, training tasks um, are things that are reducing data. Why am I telling you that? Because mathematically speaking, you can characterize all these processes in either experimental uh, data processing plane lines uh, as well as in any uh, computing type uh, um, beam lines. Uh, data processing pipeline, sorry, uh, by two characteristics. You have a data throughput um, T, and you have a data reduction rate in such a stage. So if you take your data raw as it is, and you have the low picture here, the low picture is, okay, I have data in, I have a throughput, whatever I have currently made in my file system, and I have the same large data that comes out, so nothing happens to it. If you do an intermediate step in there, you can actually say like, okay, I want to, for example, reduce my data by compressing it or by projecting it into Instagram. Right, taking 10 to the 9 particles, creating just a thousand entries in histogram. That itself has a throughput, right? That is not for not happening immediately, but it also has a reduction rate, which for example creates your data, maybe creates by 20%, makes makes it smaller, but maybe makes it also by orders of magnitude smaller, uh, because you just create histogram of that. And then you have an output again. It turns out that this is not fully, uh, yeah, that this is not fully, uh, fully easily just applicable to any problem because there is a fundamental limit that you have to achieve to in order to actually save and be, uh, time as well, not only size of your data. Um, and that's given by this ratio between the output, input, and reduction rate that you can achieve. So if you're, the, the long story is, if you pop in your numbers here, it says this is, for example, your file system, and you have your reduction rate um, and the amount of reduction. Um, if you're not fast enough in reducing your data, then this will not help you besides making your data smaller, but it will take even longer to analyze your data. Um, and this is important in the moment that you have really, you have your camera, you take data, or you have to simulate, you take data, put it on the first stage, then you want to process it further and further. The whole pipeline, every step that you have has to fulfill this criteria. Um, and the, at the time we, we analyze this, um, look for example at compression algorithms, and you can see here a breakthrough line just by taking these numbers from realistic, for example, HPC systems, and you can see that, for example, the standard compression that you use for images and experiment in PNG is too slow to have a reasonable impact these days. So you want to use something else, for example, compressors that we implement in the OpenPMP standard um, that are just as efficient. They don't lose data for you. They make it even smaller sometimes, but they are significantly faster, and due to that, you can go to higher data rates. Okay. All of that is is um, is close to our heart because it's close to our applications, both in simulations and experiments. And due to that, we thought about standardizing and sharing this with the world in the so-called open standard for parting of mesh data um, that I pitched already a little bit in the introduction. This standard allows us to write data in a very high-level description that you can focus on the physics. Um, users can add more and more information. So if your domain is plasma science or particle beam science uh, or beam dynamic science. Or, or anything else. Um, we have applications in, in particle-based um, image reconstruction biology. You can just add all the attributes that you need and make this human readable and machine actionable. Um, we implement this on common file formats such as HDF5, but we also have specific file formats um, for HPC systems. And when you use this part, it's really just by switching file outputs, um, just as in Excel store to this file format or that. And store to HD5, store to JSON, store to um, Adios. Um, that makes it extremely convenient, and you can focus on the, on the domain science. Um, we implement this in a way that we have a standardization on top of OpenPMD as a written down data standard. And then that itself is fully domain agnostic, but allows you to visualize any data or process any data that you create with that. Um, and on top of that, we have extensions that are domain specific that allow you to really add information that you care about. So for example, for us, this is things like particle species in a beam, 
um, could be anything like a particle and cell simulation, the max that was used, we have molecular dynamics, uh, mesh refinement information, or CCD images, for example, just to have a standard description of things that you're, that you're putting in. Um, the simulations that we used with the European XFL in a couple of, in, 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 in the last years is for also great front descriptions important. Um, so you can transport this from one code to the other. And then there's a lot of tooling around this that makes it really easy to use such files. So we have, for example, a universal visualization tool that you can just quickly open and see immediately what's in your data. We have a standard API or reference implementation that we developed together with process scientists. Um, and we have updated tools and validation tools that help you use this. There's implementation details like this. So we, we focus really on, on data series so that you can update um, any description from either tables or particles or n dimensional arrays. And you can describe from the beginning and have encodings like I have a ton of data that comes in and one has a one file or one distribute this. All of these things are default implemented and easy to use. You can use complex, num complex numbers um, and describe the observables. So that's OpenPMD in a nutshell. And there's a lot of documentation on this and examples. The easiest way to get in is um, we just put it into Google, read the first examples, and adopt them to your needs. Um, a lot of people did this. Um, so as I told you, it was started at ACER and Berkeley Lab as a collaboration um, in a couple of visits in 2015. Um, and since then, we have many contributors and adopters uh, from the following labs here. Um, and yeah. Really grateful that this is working by just yeah by standardizing and and really implementing the science needs that people have. Um, our vision then is to put this together um, with the data reduction that I mentioned before to really be able to divide, uh, to develop data pipelines. Um, and so one of the recent works that we published with Franz Pöschel was to transition from anything that you saw before where you say like okay actually I want to write a file and use this then for data analysis. To be able to replace this fully with something that never touches the disk and just is analyzed on the fly um, by streaming it from one compute node or one process to the other. And with that, you can build fully, you can take software that's fully incompatible by, this, uh, by, by implementation and actually use it as data processing pipelines. So let's say you have a very detailed modeling framework. You want to put this into a, a very custom analysis framework and stretch it through without creating data in between at a high rep rate. Um, this feels now just as similar as writing a file and you can change it as quickly as you can change the script. Um, and this, this is really the transition that we're aiming for, that we transition from data workflows where you go to disks um, that you saw in the slide before that is just not feasible at the right rates to doing everything on the fly and streaming data pipelines. And yeah, to, to, to give you a little bit more about the uh, the other research that we had in the last years on this one, so we, we actively tune, of course, also to have the performance the moment that you have to touch the file system. So we have terabyte per second data rates now achieved. Um, this is the uh, this is the uh, this is the research part that I showed you before on streaming data. So what we show here is that you can actually by using workflows where you do intermediate stages before uh, touching this, you can actually exceed bandwidth limits um, of parallel file systems. And benchmark this year with Franz in this paper. And we also look into things like while we focus of first on describing our data as this is a wake field, this is a this is a set of 2D images. At the end, what this really counting is how you process and how you wanna what, what analysis you want to actually do in this data. And so what we did in the last part here is doing data online an uh, online data layout reorganization organization specifically for n-dimensional data sets that are not just a 1D array, but like 2D data, 3D data, higher dimensional data. And what is actually the best layout underneath um, to make this efficient in data processing? And for this, we go intentionally to collaborate with computer scientists, um, describe our problems, and share them with them. And um, do I also invite you to share your problems because that's the only way how um, how you can actually do research in this way and, and yeah, forward this to computer scientists. So in summary, what we do for data is we standardize and develop scalable data methods. We bring them into nice interfaces so that you can quickly take a look at the data as you see here in the middle. And we connect this to the ecosystem that is far beyond what we can develop ourselves. So we connect this to, uh, to leading visualization tools like PowerView and Visit, um, to astrophysical frameworks like YT, and to, pay, uh, to parallel data, um, data science frameworks like DASK. Um, and make this available to the user. And in the, the core is since we agree on standardizing OpenPMP, 
it's extremely easy for anyone to contribute exactly what they need and share this with the community. And we have a huge synergies from that that we used over the last years. Now, the last section, I want to go a little bit about HPC, the Accessible Computing Project um, that's currently ongoing and, um, and beyond. The, uh, the Accessible Computing Project is a, is, 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 a, is a really beneficial project, actually, because it forces us to bring together computational scientists, computer scientists, domain scientists, and mathematicians, and actually reuse software that we're developing. So things that we have been propagating also here, and Mike is propagating, like that, you, that you cannot, as a physicist, sit down and just reinvent the wheel for this domain science problem. You actually have to talk to experts, and you have to understand each other and explain things. And one of the examples that we do here is we, we for example, collaborate with, uh, with data scientists that I showed you already, but also with station scientists, um, then performance doing scientists, and so on and so on, um, and are actually evaluated in a sustainable project by actually using and making useful products in the end. Um, and so what we do here is an example is, is novel visualization techniques. So um, the pro a problem, a common problem that you can do is you want to visualize particles, and our simulations are 10 to the 11, 10 to the 13 particles that you get around. And the uh, it's on the left hand side what you see here is that's that's how we do it. So it's just showing you all the particles that could be a ray trace can, can reach and it's not very visible. Um, what is what is interesting is if you wanna if you want to visualize anything that is not boring in the simulation, right? what's an uncommon property? And what we did here is we, we looked for uncommon properties in specifically in the momentum distribution and intentionally selected them and baked them more heavily so that you can see all the parties that are not just streaming by and that they feel accelerated here, but that are actually scattering and forming these separatrix. And this is a technique that, that was developed here that we tried on one X that is. Basically, you don't need to supervise this. You don't have to be there and say, like, okay, this is the part that is, that is uncommon. Um, and yeah, this is yeah, um, this is one of the things that we demonstrated. Another thing um, that I want to show you on the right hand side is uh, a math project that we do or that, that I lead with a PhD student um, on, on extending the DDKM framework, that new ray tracing techniques, so that do actually that do tra uh, trace line techniques on following. Not lines that are motivated by some vector field, which is the traditional computer science approach for that, but going to the physical motivation of that. So the problem is if you trade particles here in the wave field as well, or on a particle beam uh, dynamic simulation, is that you have to dump them as often as you need them to have a nice track to follow the particles. And this can be challenging if you don't know at the beginning which particle will actually be the one that's interesting. For example, because you're checking it from a background. Um, or because yeah, you just don't know um, upfront which particle will end up in which space or phase space. So what you traditionally have to do is you have to dump just a ton of particles or run a simulation twice um, and make it so reproducible that you can pick the simulation particles at the end, go back and then start again tracking them, which is not a yeah not a cheap cost. So what we did here is uh, we instead of pushing particles just in an EOB field, uh, or just creating lines in the EOB field, we actually we, we took the particle cell particle pusher, so the physical loans force pushes, and implemented them directly in a ray tracing uh, or in a, in a pass line flow trace line algorithm and follow them. So the particle that we do here is we dump our fields and then really push in particles and let them evolve due to a realistic physical force um, and following those. And that saves, can you save you like orders of magnitude? Of, of output with uh, fidelity. So it can take a simulation and then just say, okay, what is actually a real physical Z particle doing here um, to visualize that? And that's just possible because this stuff was uh, redeveloped. Then, how do we wrap this all together? Um, we actually, from the beginning, document everything in the open. So the moment that we put an implemented implement feature in there is an example, there is a test case. So what X, for example, has like 188. Uh, test cases right now that run on every single change of code and make sure that like beam driven electron acceleration, vector acceleration is all working. Um, on top of them, then we have the uh, um, documented detailed examples if you want to take a case and develop this. We test this on the major um, backends that we support for faster exascale that's uh, primarily AMD GPUs. We have CUDA GPUs in pre exascale machines, and we will have Intel GPUs probably end of the year next year as well. Um, on a on a first access game machine, and yeah, and then fully closing the loop is at the end you have to give this to a user. And so what we what is really important to us is that it's it's basically a one liner, maybe two lines to install the whole software stack that I showed you. 
So obviously, this is a complex problem that we are solving. And obviously, we have a very complex software stack that I showed you. But it does not mean that a user has to feel any of that. Right? For a user, it should be as easy as putting a standard line in there and having a software either on, on their laptop or on an HPC system. And for that, again, we have to work with computer scientists. Um, there are great projects like the Stack Package Manager that make this totally feasible to get any software on any HPC system in the world. Um, and yeah, for that, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Now a little bit, uh, a last detail uh, to go a little bit down to the world X trenches and to Annex, um, so that you see a little bit how we implement this uh, specifically um, if, if you work in this, in this, in this part. The NREX library for us does things like domain composition and for mesh refinement and load balance. So that means if you have a large system that you want to model, you cut it into pieces and then you have to communicate things that overlap over time and to be efficient um, and to be able to iterate this actually forward. The, we do the same thing then in mesh refinement by putting additional layers on top of that and then communicating also between coarse resolutions, high resolutions where you have, for example, a plasma target and then um, updating this set consistently. All of that is implemented in that library. We also put in here a performance portability layer. So there's a similar, for example, to Cockroach or Alpaca or Raja, um, which is in C++, which then does the different tiling strategies um, for executing on CPUs or GPUs um, and hides this from you so that you don't have to re-implement the physics parts. Um, then obligatory scaling plot you're still in order of magnitude faster by using GPUs instead of CPUs and nodes. So of course use GPUs. Um, and that's the, the scaling plot to uh, the full size of the summit supercomputer um, that yeah that we measured and the comparison to using the CPUs. Our approach then is how do we implement the physics? The physics is we implement then in primitives, um, parallel primitives like update every particle position there where you can literally then implement a function that looks just straight at the physics implementation. And that's the way how we implement WarpX. That's the way how we implement ImpactX and all these codes. You can narrow down this on, um, on updating the construct ones, um, and then you compile this down to the individual routines. There's a bit more of tiling on top of that that we do that loops around this, which then start the kernels, but the parallel for themselves that the kernel and um, that we execute. And there are other primitives like stands and reduces that give you like energy um, and histogram and so on. We use parallel linear solvers. Uh, for example, you have like multi-critical source solvers. If you have your mesh fine part, embedded boundaries, you need specific um, data structures for that, as well as numerics to, for example, have a smooth transition if you have a party accelerator and you want to approximate its wall. Um, and then we have things like runtime parsers that even run on GPU so that if a user comes and has a very complex function that they just want to quickly express, then they are able to express this in the input file. You don't have to recompile the code. Um, you can do this, of course, faster in multiple steps, but the thing is, at the end, you want to quickly be able to express the physics problem, um, and then you develop these features. Now, a little teaser. This is the latest paper that we submitted in April to the supercomputer conference. And what we did here is we scaled Warp X on the three largest machines in the world. Unfortunately, between that came new machines out, so it's only the top five machines now that we were on. Um, but uh, yeah, what we did is we, we scaled from, from one node up to the full size of these machines um, and checked that we can actually do what we try to achieve, which means we want to have more resolution, be able to, uh, to model larger problems in greater detail um, through weak scaling. It means taking more questions, more problems, more the problem size, taking more compute size. And that's left inside. And what you can see here is if you, if you really start like really low, low size, um, one load up to the full full size, we are super efficient at the end still. We lose performance because there's communication over that because networks are not perfect, but at the end, we still have like 75% up to 80, 85% efficiency on these machines. Um, and they are all in different architectures. Fukaku is, uh, is a new generation of CPU ARM processors. Tomat is NVIDIA GPUs. Summit is also NVIDIA. Crusher is AMD GPUs that we benchmarked here. And then the, uh, then the second spray is, uh, part here is strong scaling. That means you just take more compute to be faster. That, of course, is fundamentally limited by running out of work at some point. But even here, you can go pretty well over one to two orders of magnitude and still get a speed up out. Um, what we also generally do is we, we follow this performance that we develop so we can actually deliver this promise over time by doing a figure of merit calculation 
the figure of merit itself is, is just a benchmark that we defined. And it's a similar problem that uh, most of the contribute team um, has to, to follow for the car project and um, going for, for the frontier system that was just revealed. But basically, what we, what we benchmark is how fast can we update fields and particles um, that are relevant to the science problem and do this with a, with a science case. And then, yeah, the, the right hand side is basically this number that has to go up um, if you're improving. Um, and otherwise, you have to go back. So, yeah, you can see that we constantly improve the code and constantly this number goes up. If we have a regression, we address it. And um, yeah, we really take an eye on that, that we can actually deliver this machine. Then here's a, um, here's a specific optimization that we had. I think that one I will keep for, for the detail and skip that. I want to show instead of a, an interesting problem that we had for dynamic load balancing. So what I'm showing here is uh, we had a, what I modeled here is the laser plasma interaction between a near critical target. Um, in this case of, uh, what did we put here? We put cylinder geometry. Um, and the problem that usually happens if you model laser plasma accelerators, it looks pretty much like this. Right? You start somewhere nicely homogeneous, so you kind of have an idea where you could put your individual GPUs. And then you start interacting with the target and everything gets somehow like compressed. You have suddenly a front where all the electrons and ions are, are meeting. They are suddenly pretty much at this yellowish front here in the middle of the target. And then the, if you have thousands of GPUs working on this problem, it's pretty likely that if you don't do anything, it will just run out of memory on one of them and everything crashes. Um, so what we do is we, uh, we tile everything up into uh, um, individual small boxes that can, for example, be on a space filling curve, but however you distribute them in space is, is up to your parameterization. Um, and yeah, the, the main decompose them and over decompose the problem, right? There's, there's multiple boxes that you can exchange between different ranks. And what we researched here is, is how do you make up this distribution, right? For that, you need to analyze somehow find out the cost, a uh, cost function. So you can take a heuristic and say, there's so many particles here. But for any non-trivial algorithm, just counting number of cells and particles is not sufficient. So think about things like collisions, for example, right? Um, if you do dynamic collisions, you have Monte Carlo parts in there. They don't scale necessarily linearly with the number of particles. Um, they could scale n cross n, um, depending on what, on what you're doing. Um, and so what we did is we developed, we, we researched this paper on multiple and super cost analysis functions. So we, on the fly, tried to find either models or heuristics or real measurements um, of timing um, and found a way to, to find a good cost factor based on, on timings. And with that actually found out that you can actually get a speed up just by having a better cost um, that goes into the, uh, into the algorithm that you use for the main decomposition. Um, and so we also did a theoretical performance model for this, compared this here. Um, and there's not only the speed up up to 3.4x, but also there's all these runs here at scale um, they actually are not able to run at all without dynamic load balancing because you would run out of memory. Um, and these are these runs that I marked here. So just really, if you have a science case, you want to scale up to, let's say, 10,000 nodes, you need this to be productive. Um, and that's what we implemented and showed in this paper in, in task 21. All right. Then I usually like to have one challenge um, to, to pose for people. Um, the, that is actually current research that we're doing, and, and that's not a published results. So if you have an idea on this, um, that would be a fun one. The, um, the, the funny problem if, if in cutting a cycle is the problem. You have parties and cells, you can of course estimate your cost. But if you then use a, domain, a distribution function, let's say a space filling curve, where you try to keep everything nicely close together in communication, you could end up in the following situation. On the top right hand, we show a laser wave accelerator, and we have a beam that's just about to enter the wave accelerator. You have basically no party cost at all on the left hand side because that's vacuum, and you have a lot of party cost on the right hand side. If you decide to distribute this on a space filling curve, it will up. basically come up with that. So, like, that's a great idea. There's no particles, fields are cheap, put everything in one ring and the rest on the other. That works pretty well for everything besides rank zero, which will run out of memory. Um, so what, what do you do? You need a better cost. So do you come up with a heuristic um, or something else? We tried a couple of these things and then realized the fundamental issue um, with any cost, which is that in the party and cell algorithm, specifically the electromagnetic one, you actually have two phases that you cannot, cannot treat equally. You have actually an update of your particles and you have an update of your fields. And each of them have their own cost. And even if you reduce one of them to, zero, to near zero or the other, um, you actually have to optimize something, not the whole function, but you have to optimize them individually. 
Um, and that's a totally different to a problem to optimize than just optimizing an image scale up. Um, so if any one of you has a has a nice way to optimize this, reach out and uh, we will try this because we have we have, we have nice problems. <laughs> Um, yeah, so how we solve this today is with heuristics, um, obviously, but uh, it would be cool to have this um, actually of the um, proper um, constraint that we can use to space to curves. Um, then usability, I want to show you one thing just to how we how we wrap everything together. So I showed you Blast framework, but also WAP actually has a long tradition of writing things in a modular manner. So I showed you this parting and self framework, how WAP which is the predecessor to WAPX implemented this in NICE 495, was to actually write individual modules and glue them intentionally together fully with Python, right? Because there is, of course, a separation of the constraints when you want to be fast, you want to be fast in pushing particles, but there's absolutely no time limit, limit for you to say, like, I know the next thing is current in this issue. Like, you have hundreds of milliseconds to express this if, you're, if you have enough parts to push up. And say, let's say tens of milliseconds. So the um, model, Mark recognized this early and built this basically into quick modules that we glue together for the algorithmic flexibility and be able to extend them. Um, what we do in the ACP, the uh, next computer project, is we transition to C++, sure, but still want to have bindings um, to these four Python modules to be flexible. Um, Zaya, come, Zaya will come back to your question, didn't, didn't catch it quickly on the fly. Um, and we expose hooks um, to that. What I'm currently doing in an LDRD is both developing this new Impact X project, but also start, since we developed this new library in between, we do actually an exposure to Python or scripting languages. You can do the same thing pretty quickly to Julia if you're interested in that. But to do low-level exposure to all the objects that are relevant for HPC, specifically your MX objects, and expose every app as a module. So that you can actually describe a beam line that you have things like convention particles that are convention particles that are model. Then you have a plasma element and then you continue with conventional products that are modeling. Um, we expose on top of that all the memory that you have directly as it lies on the GPU or whatever the device you can use for computing. So specifically, if you're going to things like AI and ML training, you, you don't need to copy the data, right? Because the data is on GPU, it can be well described with standards, and your, your TensorFlow or Keras or whatever model is able to pick this up as a tensor directly. Um, and the trick for that is, yeah, community standards again. We implement community standards to expose these parts in, in Python. And then you can even do things like full C++ HPC code and extend it on the fly with Python kernels. If you want to just quickly prototype, that totally works. If you want to be fast, then you just use different Python modules for that. But this is exactly the, the way how we want to continue to, to use things by having everything in, in portable modules and being able to plug in a module that, for example, is developed with the other portability framework. Um, and doing them together. And yeah, so yeah, IML training and surrogates is, of course, a, a main motivator for that one. And at the end, we already have optimization workflows that take whole simulations and optimize them um, as ensemble simulations. So, where your problem is, for example, minimize the returns for the pile between minimize um, energy loss or maximize energy, energy gain in the stage, and so on. Um, all right. With that, I ran through uh, quite a few topics, but let me let me give you some conclusions. Um, so Blast the, uh, is, a, is an open suite of parting and cell codes for parting and cell modeling. We built this on modern C++ libraries, specifically in our case, the MREX library, to be based on, um, to be mesh refinement capable, to be a GPU acceleration, and to can so that we can focus on the numerical physics modules and uh, numerics actually of those to do beam and plasma modeling. Um, ECP Bob X is our Lighthouse application that we developed for this in the XSK computing project, but we leverage this development to update and modernize the whole beam modeling framework. Amrex um, facilitates this GPUs and mesh refinement, I mentioned that, and we have a vibrant ecosystem by now from contributors and as well the, the ecosystems of, that you can actually use with. And yeah, if there's um, anything of interest to you, please feel, reach, uh, feel, free, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'll leave you with this picture of a plasma wake feed accelerator here um, and then take your questions. Thanks.